So over the last few months, Teresa has been having conversations with various people in Newquay, um, and she also uh, arranged an online survey. From this, we now know that housing is one of the key points that people in Cana with were, were, uh, were worried about. Um, people were worried about different aspects of housing, um, some of which were. Um, some people felt that uh, the main problem was that house prices were too high and out of reach of local people. Um, some felt that there were too many second homes. Others felt that um, owners of second homes were keeping businesses to go uh, throughout the winter months and that they were indeed a part of the community. At the same time, others felt that there were um, too many of these houses being being let as holiday lets, okay, which is slightly different from second homes. Um, and as a result, the heart of the community was being diluted. Some were worried that there wasn't enough social housing or sheltered housing for older people. And others were worried uh, uh, that there was nowhere for young people to buy or indeed rent. At the end of the session, we will be asking everybody, what can we do about this? Or what should we be doing next? As someone who's worked in various housing roles with local governments for nearly a quarter of a century, and I know I don't look old enough, um, I am aware of different factors that can um, influence the sector the sensitivity that can arise from housing issues. But that's enough about me. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Um, I'll introduce them in turn. Um, so basically the first person we have to speak today is Keith Henson, um, who is a rural housing enabler uh, with Barkit Housing Association, and he'll be speaking about supporting local housing. Enablers work with and on behalf of rural communities across Wales to address the shortage of affordable homes. And Keith covers Caridikion and the surrounding areas. So if you're ready, Keith, over to you. Welcome all. Um, Teresa, are you... Uh... Uh, sharing the screen. Hello. Ah, Nani, Jochen Vor. Um, so, Jochen Vor Makable, Sharad Borama, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak tomorrow, uh, this morning, tomorrow even. Um, so, I'm Keith Henson, Rural Housing Enabler at Cerdigion uh, and the Borders, uh, based in Barkid. Uh, next slide then, please, Teresa. Uh, the role is funded by uh, Barkid, Carmarthenshire County Council, and the uh, Welsh Government. And next slide then, please. Um, that's uh, a picture actually up in North Wales. Uh, just shows you the the, um, the rurality uh, and the need for rural housing enablers throughout uh, uh, rural areas of Wales. And next slide. So that's the network basically of rural housing uh, enablers. And as you can see, um, it's basically 75, 80% of Wales and obviously in rural areas. And um, you know, even Ceredigion, if you go to Aberystwyth, you'll see a patch of green land. So obviously that covers rural areas as well. Next slide. So ultimately the role is about delivering affordable housing in rural areas and uh, making sure that support and help is available to all different uh, kinds of people within society. Next slide. It's crucial basically to the success of the role that it's um, working on behalf of the community and not just on behalf of the 
um, the RSL, the registered social landlord or the private developer, um, and it's actually helping people trying to find solutions, uh, which is obviously becoming more and more challenging or we wouldn't be here today talking about it. Next slide. There's a steering group uh, that controls the uh, controls um, and you know, forward plans, I suppose, activities for the rural housing enabler within Ceredigion and surrounding areas. Um, Ceredigion County Council, and that's the housing team and the planning department as well. Cranlandshire County Council, obviously, as they fund part of the role. Barkid, and uh, that's coming from the housing director side of it. In Clice Cymru, then One Voice Wales is the representative body for community councils in Wales. And um, we're quite fortunate that the representative from Ian Clice Cymru is Linford Thomas, who's also the chair of the Development Control Committee within Ceredigion County Council. So that helps get that kind of feeling in terms of the, the, the kind of challenges that they also face as a, as a Development Control Committee. Next slide. So in terms of housing needs assessment, which is one of the, the key things really to look at when uh, trying to consider the type of homes and houses that people need in certain areas. This is one of the key tools that is available. Next slide. And it's basically looking at what, the, what there is now and also looking at the need. So looking at the type of houses that people currently live in is it the right size? Is it, you know, uh, is it too small, too big? Additional needs, if there's, uh, you know, um, medical needs, if the houses need to be adapted, bungalows, etc. So it's it's very important when we do a housing need assessment that we look at those kind of aspects as well. And also looking at the kind of salary ranges that people uh, um, fall into, because obviously with house prices as they are at the moment, you know, you're looking at about seven times the average salary to buy a average house within Cerdigion. Um, and no mortgage company would be willing to lend that kind of money. Um, so those are the kind of challenges that we, we, we are faced with. Next slide. So when we do a housing need assessment, we look at um, kind of paper-based and social media. And uh, obviously social media is one of the, the key drivers at the moment, but notwithstanding that you know, a lot of people don't have access to um, the internet or smartphones, etc. So we need to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to complete um, one, one of these uh, housing assessments. Um, and I think it's key that people do get the opportunity and also trying to promote that kind of activity as well to make sure that people do complete it. Because the more evidence that we have, the more opportunity that we have to influence kind of local authorities and Welsh government to provide additional funding, possibly to look at additional um, solutions to uh, providing uh, affordable housing. Next slide. The uh, the next slide um, would. We just look at really the need for more or less space, you know, upsizing and downsizing. And that's one of the key things within Ceredigion because of the nature of um, the uh, demographics that we have within um, within the county. I'm not sure if you're able to move on to the next slide there, Teresa. The housing needs assessment then would look at um, the challenges for the community. And um, obviously we're all here today to, to try and look at what the challenges are and possibly come up with some kind of solutions as well. And the challenges for the community would be, you know, land cost. Um, that's one of the key things. Development costs, how much it costs to build houses nowadays, especially if we're looking at kind of carbon neutral houses. Um, the cost of society, as Adrian mentioned earlier in terms of second homes or if it's holiday lets, um, you know, the impact that those kind of homes have within communities where perhaps small schools are facing challenges to remain open. So it's important that we look at those kind of things. Um, and second homes, obviously, because whilst um, they contribute to the economy in some shape or form during the, the year, you're possibly not 100% throughout the year and therefore that has an impact on um, the, the economy within the rural areas. 
So the housing need assessment, basically we're looking at evidence for developers, for social housing needs, and for the local authority. And um, you know, when we look at those kind of things, we need to make sure that the evidence is, is captured in, in the right way. Um, uh, unfortunately, the, the PowerPoint, PowerPoint seems to have frozen at the moment. So um, moving on to the next section, then we'll be looking at the housing register, which the local authority control. And um, just slight overview here in terms of we're looking at the need for social housing and affordable housing. And this, again, is an evidence base for the local authority to look at. And whilst it's not um, capturing everybody's details, and sometimes people just complete it for the areas that they want to live in, and if there's nothing available there, then people won't complete it. So we need to make sure that, um, you know, that we do provide the evidence and that the local authority, again, captures the evidence. Now, the housing register is actually managed by the local authority, and um, it's, it's very important that we do promote this aspect as well, especially people who are in need of social housing. Um, within the slides, and the slides will be made available to you, so um, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that that um, is, is made available. Oh, that's it. So if you go to the next slide again, and the next one then, please. And um, this just shows brief details of what the housing uh, register does provide. And next slide. And then you know, people will have heard about banding. So this provides um, the kind of band A, B, C, D, E, F um, aspects of um, what banding is available. Again, on the housing options register, more information is available there. And um, it tends to be that the band A, B, and C are the most um, important ones that we do provide housing for. Uh, next slide. So we work in partnership with um, the uh, local communities, local authority, local councillors, county and community there. And the community council is very important in order to provide information and uh, also working with uh, elected members um, within the county, such as uh, Eileen and Ben, and they are more than uh, aware of the issues that are out there. Uh, working with landowners, developers, wide range of housing associations, and also other RHEs, really housing enablers. And uh, next slide then, please. It's making sure that the voices of those in need are heard, basically. So you know, people are contacting me to say, oh, I can't get a house, I can't get a mortgage and things. Uh, how do I get on the register? So it's providing that kind of support and making sure that they understand um, that it doesn't happen overnight as well, unfortunately. Um, next slide. So, you can see there how it can contribute to the sustainability of rural communities, you know, making sure that the Welsh language and society uh, uh, still continues, maintaining social networks, you know, not your Facebook and Twitter, obviously, but actual social network, which has been a bit of a challenge over the last year, I suppose. Creating up employment where houses are built, nice, attractive environments, and making sure that they do fit into the, to the area and that they are efficient, and also retention of local services such as schools. And next slide. So some of the local representatives here, thankfully nobody's aged over the last 12, 14 months. So that's, uh, that's a positive there. And the uh, next slide, which we'll probably discuss later, is looking at house prices, council powers, are they, have they got enough? Local lettings policy, making sure that the community uh, have an input into what, what kind of demographics um, uh, live in the area, and also the availability of housing stock. Uh, next slide, which is the last one. Uh, those are my contact details. And again, you know, these slides will be shared, so you'll have an overview of uh, the kind of conversation that we've had this morning. Thank you. Thank you to Keith. An interesting um, presentation. We'll come back to the questions at the end of the four presentations. So the next speaker is Lee. John, who is uh, who works for Self Build Wales and the Welsh Development Bank, and he's going to talk about self build opportunities and the Welsh Development Bank. Lee works to build relationships and customer base and builders to undertake self successful self build projects. So, if you're ready, Lee, we'll hand over to you. 
Um, my name's uh, Lee John, and I work for the Development Bank of Wales uh, on the Self Build Wales scheme, and I'm the Self Build Executive for West Wales. If we can go straight to the third slide, please, Theresa. So Self Build Wales is an exciting new scheme established by the Welsh Government and delivered on behalf um, on their behalf by the Development Bank of Wales. It's a 210 million pound fund to assist people building their own home, helping to increase the, uh, the supply of housing, whilst also boosting the Welsh construction industry. The scheme aims to make building your own home in Wales more accessible by removing many of the barriers that currently prevent people from doing so. This scheme will diversify the housing market in Wales and help meet the demand for self and custom built homes. Self Bail Wales provides a more affordable route to home ownership for those who can afford a mortgage but are unable to raise the large deposits needed. If we can go, that's brilliant. So, the Self Bail Wales scheme makes self build more accessible by providing plots with outline planning permission, reducing the purchaser deposit, uh, providing a loan that covers 75% of the costs for a plot, plus 100% of the bill costs. And there are no repayments until the new home is complete, helping self-builders to maintain their current lifestyle. Self-build Wales is available to anyone who wants to live and build in Wales. They, they, they can then take advantage of the scheme. If we can go on to the next slide, please, Teresa. And the next one. Brilliant. So a couple of key, key criteria of the scheme. So the scheme is not intended to aid grand design projects, but to support good quality family homes. The home must be the owner's sole residence. And the new home cannot be rented or sold for a minimum of five years completion. The scheme can only be used to purchase a plot available from the Self Build, Wheel web, Self Build Wheels website. The Self Build Wheels development loan can only be used, cannot be used as a funding mechanism to build a property on privately owned plot. The scheme can only be used by each applicant once. So just a quick overview then um, of the Self Build Wheel website. If we can go on to the, to the next slide, please, Teresa. So the scheme is a complete online offering. Um, plots are identified using the interactive map and purchased through an application process online. The website pr also provides a comprehensive overview of the scheme that informs both prospective applicants and builders. On to the next slide, please, Teresa. And again, just another view of the interactive map on the website. On to the next slide, please. Yeah, so the interactive map, the, the, the plots can be searched by entering a postcode or the name of a chosen area. If no plots are available within a desired area, the prospective self-builder can register an interest in that area and will be notified when plots become available. So this is an important point for, for many people within the community. Because if they do go onto the Self Build Wills website and register that interest, that's our way of expressing that the, the demand is there, but more importantly, where the demand is. So this gives us the opportunity then to, to contact potential prop providers, the local authority being, a, being one of them, and just making people understand that the, the demand in their area for this type of scheme for self-build is available, which will then hopefully encourage them to bring plots forward to be entered into the scheme. If we can move on to the next slide, please. So on, on the self-build website, plots will be uh, identified with a traffic light system. So red just simply means that the site is currently under in, um, consideration. Amber means that it's ongoing uh, planning application or any enabling works. And the green status then means that the site is open for application. And on to the next slide, please. 
So the majority of plot providers are expected to be local authorities and house associations across Wales. However, private landowners can now enter into the scheme. But it, we, we must remember that the scheme cannot be used as a funding mechanism to build, build a property on their own plot. So private landowners can now enter their plot into the scheme to be purchased by others, but not used to develop on their own plot. The scheme can be used to utilise underused and underdeveloped land. And the self builders team are working closely with prop providers to identify as many, as many viable sites as possible. On to the next slide, please. So once each plot goes <coughs> green and goes or becomes available for application on the website, each plot will come with a plot passport. And each plot passport will include key information for each plot, such as the price for each plot, the planning conditions, any plot priorities, the approved property designs, estimated bill costs, and any other information that's relevant for that plot. If we can move on to the next one, please, Teresa, I think the next one will be more important. So that's right, the plot, provide, uh, the plot priorities and the award process is something um, that's key for the community. So application priorities are set by the plot provider and can differ with, between each plot. Priorities can help prop providers meet local housing and social needs, and priorities for each plot can be found within that plot passport. So this is where the control can be can, can be within can be with a plot provider, who they bring into the area and who they bring into the community. So these priorities are, are intended to help the prop provider decide who a plot should be awarded to in the event that more than one application is received for each plot and then a scoring system will be used to determine who will be awarded a plot based on how closely the applicant meets the specific criteria if we can move on if we can move on please yeah, Wendy, it's frozen again hang on a second i'm just going to stop sharing bear with me lee no problem Share screen again. No, hang on a second. Ah, there we go. There you are, we're okay. So to ensure that the level of quality is met, a builder working on the scheme must be Trustmark registered. Now Trustmark is a government endorsed quality scheme and information can be found on their website. If we can move on. So a price and schedule will be agreed between the applicant, the builder and self-build wheels. Loans will be payable directly to the appointed builder on completion of pre-agreed milestones following validation from building control and the contract administrator. A maximum uh, term of the, the, or the maximum term of the loan is two years. Therefore the build must be complete within this time. If we can move on to the next bit. So as I just said, the maximum term of the loan is 24 months from when the plot purchase is complete. All funds will be, re, uh, will be paid directly to the plot provider for the land purchase and to the builder for the building works. Interest is charged on the loan, but only on the amount of funds drawn at various stages throughout the build. Interest will be rolled up and only becomes payable upon repayment of the loan. Arrangement fees and exit fees are payable and can be added to the loan. This does not have to be paid until the build is complete unless the applicant chooses to do so. So this is just a breakdown of how the self-build wheels development loan can work. So if we look at the, the, the initial phase of, of purchasing the plot, if we say the plot is available for £50,000, the applicant will only have to pay 25% deposit. So they'll only have to pay 12 and a half thousand pounds upfront. The self-bill self -bill wills will fund the remaining 75% of the development loan. Self-bill wills will then pay 100% of the bill costs. So if we, if we say the bill costs are 100 grand, 
and the end property value is 200 grand, the applicant then will only have to raise 150,000 pound as a, as a standard mortgage. So we'll be then working at a 75% loan to value. So just to finish, um, I'd just like to touch that we've researched, you know, we're pleased to announce that we've recently been able to award our first plot and we'll be adding more sites and plots to our website as soon as they become available. Uh, we are committed to, to helping people in Wales build their own home and, and are actively working with landowners across Wales to identify more suitable sites and to hopefully progress existing ones. Please feel free if you have any questions to contact me using these details. And again, feel free to ask any questions once everyone's spoken. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. That was very interesting indeed. We'll move on to our next speaker now, Casey Edwards. Looking for the Wales Cooperative Centre, talking about best practice examples of cooperative and community-led housing. Casey works with people across Wales trying to find uh, solutions for local housing needs. Over to you, Casey. Thank you, Adrian, and good morning, everyone. This morning, uh, like Adrian said, I'm Casey from the Wales Cooperative Centre, um, and I work on the Communities Creating Homes programme. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Um, if we go to the next slide, please, Teresa. Are we having I'm a, I can share my own presentation if that's easier. Um, I'll give it one more go. Not sure why it's doing this today. I've never had this happen before. Now it's happened three times in a row. Sorry about this. I'm just going to close. It's gone now. Okay. So share screen. Okay. If we could just go to the next slide, that would be great. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, like I was saying, I'm, I work on a programme called the Communities Creating Homes programme. And on, a, on the previous slide, there was a, just a little video about why housing is so expensive. And I, I don't think that I need to show that video this morning, um, but it just gives a, a really nice overview of some of the challenges that we're facing within the housing sector, um, not only in Wales, but across the UK as well. Um, so the aim of our programme, Communities Creating Homes, is to create a thriving community-led housing movement in Wales, which grows the supply of good quality, affordable homes that meets the, need, uh, meets the local need and where communities will grow and prosper. So we're funded by the Welsh Government and the Nationwide Foundation, um, and it's a three-year funded project to um, help create a community-led housing movement. So we're the only community-led housing hub in Wales, and we've got a team of accredited advisors that will help people to develop these innovative solutions to housing problems in their areas. And um, if we could go to the next slide, thank you very much. Um, so some of you may be asking what community-led housing is. Um, it's a pr pretty sort of broad um, term, um, but for us, it's about local people taking a leading and lasting role um, in creating secure, affordable homes and strengthening their communities. So I think I've just highlighted the sort of key words for me in the sort of definition of community-led housing. And that's sort of the local people taking a leading and lasting role. Um, so it's actually local people and local communities deciding what kind of housing is most appropriate um, for their communities. Um, the homes have to be affordable um, and it's about strengthening, strengthening your own community. It's not about sort of, you know, lining the pockets of private investors or private home um, house builders coming in and deciding what housing is right for, for that community. It's about pe people taking action in their own communities. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. So it's a really bespoke approach and it, it can come in many shapes and sizes. I think that's the, the beauty of community-led housing. So we've just got some examples here. So it could be friends buying a shared house together. So maybe they couldn't necessarily afford an individual mortgage. So they've all come together and bought a collective property. It could be leaseholders joint, uh, jointly managing their homes. So it's not just about um, home ownership or um, socially renting or privately renting homes. It's sort of community-led housing covers all tenures. 
Um, it could be actually communities coming to, together and developing new housing on, on land in their community. Um, it could be live, people living off the land. Um, and it's, it's not just about new build. We um, have lots of projects that want to convert empty properties in their areas because they, they see the blight on their community that uh, empty ho homes cause. Um, and again, it could be social enterprises um, developing homes and then communities taking over existing assets. So it, that's just a sort of range of the projects that, that we work with and the sort of community-led housing is for everyone. It covers all 10 years um, and it comes in, in many shapes and sizes, like I said. So I'm just going to go through um, various different examples of community-led housing just to give you a flavour of, of the different projects that we work with in Wales and across, across the UK as well, and hopefully um, will inspire you to think about housing in your own communities. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so I think the, the most common sort of form of community-led housing that usually springs to mind for people is housing cooperatives. Um, and it, if you know anything about sort of a cooperative retail structure or a workers cooperative, it's a similar sort of situation in a housing cooperative. So residents come together and actually democratically manage their homes. It can be in the form of ownership or it can be in the form of, of renting as well. Um, and it's usually on quite a small scale, um, but there are examples of large housing cooperatives across the UK. Um, and it can be um, new build homes or existing homes. And there are a couple of examples um, of housing cooperatives on the slide there. So there's the Machenfleth Housing Co-op in, in Ceredigion, or Powys, I think actually Machenfleth comes under, um, not, not quite sure. Um, but this is, uh, so two properties um, in Machenfleth and one, one the co-op owns outright. So the, the residents just pay the rent to the co-op. And then one actually, the other property they lease from a private landlord, but they manage um, all of the housing management services. So it's given them ownership of that property um, and they're really affordable rents. Um, there's a, a project in Leeds called Lilac, um, and that actually is that 20 homes are owned by the Cooperative Society. And the rents there are actually linked to local wages. It's a really innovative form of housing that's making it really affordable. And what's um, quite innovative, again, innovative about Lilac is that actually when you, you actually build up some equity within that housing co-op as well. So instead of sort of just paying rent and then if you decide to move, you don't actually have anything to show for it. With Lilac, you actually build up that equity. So then if you wanted to move on and um, maybe purchase your own home, you've got maybe a deposit then to put towards a house. Um, so that's a really new model and exciting model um, that, that's coming um, um, that's been developed across the UK. And then again, there's um, large housing cooperatives as well um, across the UK. So if you could go to the next slide, please. And then we've got co-housing. So this is a really, for, this is a, um, a, a model of community-led housing that is based on sort of shared, um, a shared community and a community ethos. So you all have your private individual homes, but then you might have a shared community space as well, whether that's a shared kitchen, um, and maybe a shared laundrette or a shared community space. Um, and it's really, they're usually designed around sort of encouraging interaction between neighbours. Um, and yeah, there's a couple of examples on the slide there. So if we go to the next slide, please. And then we've got community land trusts. So these are quite popular now across the UK and are very popular down in Pembrokeshire. Um, but it's about protect, holding land in trust to protect the assets for the community and which and that means that homes remain affordable um, in perpetuity it, again it can be new build or existing homes um, and there are again a couple of examples there of community land trusts across Wales and the UK and this community land trust can include housing or other community assets as well as so you quite often see community owned pubs and things like that as part of community land trusts um, and the next slide please um, and then again, just, just to highlight that community-led housing is not just about building new homes, but it can be about um, trans, um, refurbishing empty homes or protect, protecting existing homes. Um, so there's a couple of examples there of um, charities and organisations across the UK who are protecting empty homes and converting them into community-led housing. And that usually comes along with upskilling future residents. So it's not just about providing housing, but it's about building that community as well. Um, and just to say, all of these case studies are linked, so you can click on them and go into more detail. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. Um, 
I mean, I don't really need to cover um, self-build, Lee's just given a really good overview of the self-build Wales project, um, but there are projects across the UK that actually um, build the homes themselves, so it's actually about getting your hands dirty. Again, it's, it's not the sort of grand designs that you see on the, t the TV with Kevin, Kevin McLeod, but it's about a, a community coming together and actually building their own homes. Um, so we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, and then a big part of community led housing is about working in partnership as well. Um, and that is usually with registered social landlords, local authorities, even price, uh, private house builders and landlords as well. So we've got a couple of schemes in Wales where housing associations have actually worked with the local community. So the housing associations have, have acted as the developer essentially, and that's quite a popular model. Um, and even um, the housing association can manage some element, elements of the homes, but it's about giving the community that, that voice in how their houses are developed. Um, and then if we could go to the next slide. And then we've got, I just wanted to quickly mention land-based housing and enterprise. So this, you, this is really around the one planet development policy that we've got in Wales. Usually, typically it's about individuals sort of building their own homes and, and living off the land, but it can be done on more of a collective basis as well. And we've got um, the Rue Last project down in Carmarthen, which is really exciting, which is four homes um, for four families. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. So yeah, the, I just wanted to give you a flavour of all, of all of the different models that are available. And I think to show the intricacies of all those different models as well. And just to say that um, all of these different models can also be amalgamated together. So you can have housing co-ops as part of community land trusts. And, it, and as it's completely bespoke, then it's about the community actually designing the, your own model, essentially. But the key principles for us is that the community lead on the pro project or an equal partner. The local community own, manage and steward the homes in the long term. The homes are affordable and then the community benefit from from that development as well. And then if we could go to the next slide, please. And then this is just a sort of summary of, the, of a typical community-led housing journey. Like I said, it's completely bespoke, so it's not an easy linear uh, process, but this is a, a sort of a typical journey. And, and as the pro, as our programme, we can help you through this, through this um, journey from identifying opportunities in your community and putting your vision together to actually then making it happen um, and hopefully providing some new affordable homes in your community. Um, so if we should go, just go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, just to say thank you very much to Jochen Vaur. Um, my contact details are on the presentation. Um, so if, if anybody's got any projects or schemes that they would like to discuss with us or if they need support, then we'd be happy to help. Jochen Vaur. Jochen Vaur, Casey. Thank you, Casey. A lot of uh, useful information there. Thank you. So we move on to the final speaker, Phil Roberts from Coed Preseli. He'll be talking about the Live Work Timber Cluster and the Housing Charter for Wales. Phil with Partners has been developing a new model which provides opportunities for affordable housing and employment for local people, as well as offering a way forward for housing in Wales. So over to you, Phil. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. This is a, a project that we are trying to put together with the support of Wales Cooperative. Uh, next slide, please. This is the location of the site. Uh, my client, uh, Coyd Preseli, owns 1,600 acres of uh, woodland, and you can see it up on, on the ridge there. Uh, this site is actually the, the, the village of Rosebush is a post-industrial site. It, it, it owes its existence to slate quarrying, and uh, currently the, you can see the, the remains of the, slate, of the slate quarry there. And um, you can see the, the, the new tree planting up on the ridge and down on the right. Next slide, please. So there's a big issue about affordable housing and access to housing in, in the rural communities. Uh, and planning is a, is a major factor in that. Uh, in particular, the national parks are extremely difficult to deal with in terms of uh, granting planning consents. 
And uh, I would argue that the question should be, who are the parks for? Are they for the, the, the people of Wales or are they for holidaymakers? And I believe clearly they should be for the people of Wales. And to allow the, the parks to exclude development um, is not helping us meet our housing need. Because there is, of course, a long tradition of building in the open countryside. Uh, and it can be, and if it's done sensitively, it can be really successful. So that's the kind of background to this project. Next slide, please. So the, the concept then is, is um, bringing together the need for housing with the need for employment and, and the need for strengthening our communities. So the vision is to create a cluster because we had this vast area of forest land. The idea was to bring together six houses, each with its own workshop access to the, the wood from the forest, which is a commercial forest, uh, and, and, and uh, supporting um, individual families in creating a business and a home within the forest community. Next slide, please. Um, so that's a, that's a summary. I, I, I won't go through each of these slides because I, it's there for information after the event. Next slide, please. So this is a partnership which is supported, as I've said, by Wales Cooperative. Uh, Coid Preselli, who I'm representing, is the landowner. Uh, Down to Earth, which is a not-for-profit social enterprise, will be the developer. Uh, Sulvine manages the, um, the forest in a sustainable way on behalf of Coid Preselli. Uh, so it's an unusual partnership because it's private sector, it's not-for-profit, and it's Wales Cooperative coming together to try to deliver something a bit different. Next slide. <clears throat> the development partner Down to Earth, this is their site on um, Bringwimbach in Llanrhydion. Uh, super green, this is an area of outstanding natural beauty. Uh, and the, you know, I think they have proven that it's possible to build very low impact buildings sensitively in the open countryside. Next slide. And that's their site today. So you can see that you know they, they've got green roofs. The, 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 um, there's no tarmac, it's cockle shell paving, uh, very natural, uh, low energy. Next slide, please. And this is a, a, a current project they're building in, um, in uh, Pennard. Uh, timber frame, timber clad, highly insulated. Uh, and this is the sort of development we're talking about in, in Pant Minog. Next slide. So um, what's interesting, what, the reason I became interested in Coy Purcell was because they've won uh, gold medals for sustainable forestry. And when people talk about the impact on open countryside in Wales by building houses, uh, I think that actually the biggest impact on countryside is, is clear fell forestry. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, this is what's typically happening all over Wales. We, we're all familiar, I'm sure, with this site. Uh, the impact of this, I think, is massive. Uh, and to, for me, it's totally unacceptable for um, to clear fell a forest without take, you know, without taking impact on just without taking into account the impact on um, the landscape. There's also the issues about nature, biodiversity, birds, mammals, etc. So if you go to the next slide, this is the kind of practices that are, are currently done by Coy Preselli. So they take out individual trees, they uh, replant every tree that they've taken out, and so you've got continuous cover, which is, uh, you know, has got visual benefits, environmental benefits, protects and enhances nature, it's got economic benefits, cultural benefits, and of course, recreational benefits. Next slide. Um, as a consequence of the activities, there are bird boxes put up in all these forests and, and there's measurable improvement in biodiversity in all the Coy Preselli forests currently. Next slide. So the architectural inspiration for this is actually building in an acceptable way in the countryside, which has been done for centuries all over Wales. Current planning legislation, in my view, is absolutely not fit for purpose, and I think we need to change it. Next slide. So these are the house types that we are proposing, uh, two and three bed uh, houses 
with a, um, the design intended to add a third bedroom uh, on the first floor of a single story side addition to the, the, uh, to the three bedders to create four bedroom houses should the need arise. Next slide. Uh, this is the site layout we propose in. So it's housing um, around a cluster and in the center of the cluster, you see the workshops, uh, six workshops, each one for a, a house. Uh, around a common facility, communal facility in the centre, which will also be uh, accessible to um, the local Rosebush community. And to the right of the screen is the, the sawmill. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, an, an impression uh, of how it will look. So the intention is obviously to surround it with trees uh, land, and, and sit the houses in and, and the workshops in the landscape. So within a very short time, they will become uh, in, in, in absorbed within the natural landscape. Next slide. Um, and obviously there are benefits. So these are affordable housing for rent, managed on a cooperative basis by Down to Earth. Uh, we create a new model of live work. Uh, there's economic and employment benefits. Uh, and uh, the great thing about the reaction we've had from Pembridge County Council is that they're willing to create a new allocations and lettings policy to ensure that they can have a separate housing list of local people who could get access to these because the people come into these houses will be people who have an ambition to create a, a new work opportunity. Next slide. Some more images there. Uh, and clearly, you know, there's benefits because um, the down-to-earth model uh, revol revolves around uh, training, taking disadvantaged people from the community, teaching them construction skills. So when you're actually building their buildings, they're also creating uh, employment opportunities and also giving people skills to take on uh, elsewhere following the completion of the scheme. Um, and there'll be mentoring skills and training support for uh, ongoing on the site because Down to Earth will remain involved in running the sawmill and, and in managing the scheme. Next slide. Uh, some precedent images, the kind of uh, landscape we want to create. So you can see the you know, very low impact interventions, enhancing biodiversity rather than tarmacking everything over. Next slide. Uh, again, some more examples of the kind of uh, material. So in, the intention is that the timber for the houses will come from the forest. There's still quarry in there, so we could use slate from the quarries. Uh, so that's the kind of, and the, the images on the right are already the existing car park hedges that have been formed on the Pant Minog scheme by, by um, Coyd Priscelli. Next slide. Uh, and the, uh, again, just a bit more about ecology. So if we are talking about housing, uh, obviously with the low carbon agenda and with the need to actually address the, the aims of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, there needs to be a, a complete paradigm shift in the way we create our houses, in the way we, we, we allow opportunities for people to bring all aspects of, of, of their lifestyles uh, to create a better natural environment. And obviously landscape and biodiversity is very much a big part of that. Next slide. And this is just a, 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 a slide illustrating the kind of structure we anticipate for the cooperative that will actually manage uh, the, the live work units. And next slide. You can try and bring it to a close, please. Cymru, which uh, I, I, I've been involved with and which is, is going to Welsh Government shortly to try and get them to adopt it. Uh, the copy of the slides obviously available to everybody. Thank you, Phil. Very interesting. I've had a look at the chat box throughout the session. As far as I can see, there are no specific questions that have arisen. If you do have, um, we will allow a few minutes just to see if you have got any questions for the panel or not. If you could just note them in the chat box. 
Just a few comments I've picked up from the four very informative presentations we've received, thank you. So just picking up on Keith's presentation, first of all, it's good to see that you um, emphasize the housing survey to see what the need is now and also for the future. We must remember the housing register doesn't always show the real need. For example, if candidates are restricted to choosing or applying for, say, five uh, areas, it doesn't show the real need if they could be in need of in other areas if they were able to apply for more places. Also, the housing register doesn't always show the real picture in the fact that there is no specific provision of housing in some areas and as a result people might not apply for them for example maybe someone really needs a bungalow but if there are no bungalows in a specific area they cannot apply for them so i think that's an important point to make especially for those watching the recording of today's session another point I've noted here in terms of affordability, that's something we hear time and time again, not just in Newquay, but in many of the other areas that we work at the moment. But I think it's important to remember as well, we're not talking here just about affordability of purchasing or renting a home, but also running the home the homes must be of a quality and energy efficient so that people can pay their energy bills. And finally, um, what I've noted here, and possibly it's for the whole panel, how, oh, what's the cooperation you've seen with the planning departments in the various areas? Because at the end of the day, going back to Lee's presentation, on self-build and so on, I would think that planning departments play a very important role in this, enabling this sort of thing to happen. So I hand over to the panel. Can I come in there, Adrian? That's true about the housing register, as you say. It's a bit like a witch list where you note your ideal home really in terms of where you would want a home and when you look at the data for an area like new key in the banding there might be a hundred individuals have put in from band a to f but if you look at the local link then keradigion looks at five years if they've been working or living in the area i think the number comes down to something like 25 then so it does show in a way that more local people need to put in for the areas where they want to stay or where there are houses but no that's true it's it's just a snapshot the housing register the housing housing survey is more complete in giving more evidence and as we've discussed in the past as well in looking at either upgrading or um, the land or downgrading how affordable housing these days in terms of planning they are much more efficient in terms of air source or solar panels and so on i know several housing associations have been doing the EWI as well, the external wall insulation. So they're much more efficient these days than they used to be. And also with your point with the planning department, working quite close, they're on the steering committee as the rural housing enabler. And we think they feel frustrated sometimes in terms of the powers they have, in terms of what Welsh government is willing to give. Very often Welsh Government might not see what a rural area is, they just look at the urban areas. So we do need to differentiate there and put more pressure maybe on Senev members that we have, because unfortunately I see that Ellen has gone, but I know she is very enthusiastic in looking at more affordable housing for people in Ceredigion. Thank you, Keith. Any other comments from anyone on the panel? 
There are two other questions in the chat as well. A question, first of all, from Victoria. Is there a tension between self-built site identification and the local development plans of the various councils? Would anyone from the panel be willing to answer that? If I can come in there again, Adrian, just one comment. With housing associations, often they can look at the LDP and look at the res, the rural exception rates, where sites where there are sites to take into consideration for building social housing on the border with the LDP. So that's something. But in England, they are expanding that out in terms of looking at affordable housing to buy as well with private developers and also CLT. I'm sure Casey would know about one down in Bristol somewhere where they had planning application go through and they looked at affordable housing and also the developer sold the plot, had three plots himself. So we need to look at the systems that we have throw them out of the box and then collect back in the things that work. It doesn't always work that easy every time, of course. Lee, do you want to come in? Adrian, I just um, something to note that we are working very closely with uh, local authorities across Wales. So, so there currently isn't any tension, no. Um, uh, one thing also to remember is that for each plot to, to become green and open for application, it must um, have a minimum of outline planning permission. It must also be connected to all services and have um, highway access. So um, e e everything is considered. So, so we've had no problems to, to this point, no. Yes, uh, um, right, so any more, any question? So we'll move on to the final question. I think it's quite an appropriate question for closing this morning's session. Uh, Teresa has asked uh, the panel, what should the next steps be for New Key? I think that's uh, <laughs> I, can, I can start if you like. Yeah, um, yeah it's a, a, a very big question, um, but I think it's about recognizing what the need is so a lot of what Keith has been saying about identifying that real local need and not just looking at you know that the existing housing surveys because like we said they don't actually reflect some of the local need and I think it's for us if you're if we're, if we're talking about developing community-led housing or any type of housing I think it's just establishing a vision of what you want your community to look like I think that's a really important step coming together, identifying some of the problems, some of the opportunities, and just really sort of, you know, blue sky thinking, what do we want to achieve as a community? What do we want Newquay to be like? And then, you know, sort of work back from, you know, sort of cement your ideas of what you want to achieve and then work backwards then about how you actually achieve them. You know, whether that's community-led housing, whether it's more social housing, whether it's more home ownership, by identifying that vision in the first place, you can then put a plan in, in place, hopefully then to make it happen. I think that, that would be the next steps for me. Casey, anyone else on the panel want to add anything? Phil, yes, I think it's important to think um, more widely. Housing is one thing, but another thing that's important is where are the people going to work? how are they going to earn a living so that they can support the community so i think it's much more wide-ranging i think we're too restricted at the moment so we have to keith did you want to speak i'll come in after you uh, sorry Yes, that's all I think that's very important is to be sure that we look more widely and see, well, thinking of schools also and what's going to meet the needs of local people. That's vitally important. Keith? 
I fully agree because often we talk about this tension. One of the terms that's used, of course, with second homes and local people, but of course, we must remember as well that the economy depends, especially in an area like New Key, on people who do come in to spend their money here. But what we also need to consider maybe is the model of live work where new homes, we now need to think about the broadband and additional room for working from home for an office, self-build and so on. Would, um, would, so we need to take into consideration all the challenges that we have and I think the way forward is that we keep discussing and have more links with people in Newquay and I'd be willing to be a part of those discussions if possible, I'm sure as, as all of us here. Yes, I agree. And when you think of COVID and how people have begun working from home much more now, there might be a chance there to get more people working from home and creating local businesses. And that's really important, isn't it? So you talk about people coming in to the village uh, for holidays. We have second homes and so on. I think it's more important to begin from within the community and create something for ourselves rather than depending on other people coming in to support us. So I think we have to create work. That's vitally important to me. Fully agree. And also there might be an opportunity. I know, I don't know if Teresa knows about this, but Canela Cardi, are there more opportun community opportunities from looking at the local, uh, the rural development plan, that's something to look at as well, I think. Uh, Lee? Um, from the South Build Wales perspective, <coughs> we need to identify viable sites or plots that can be entered in the scheme. So one way we can achieve that is being able to demonstrate the demand in the area so we need the people of the community to go on to the self build wheels website register an interest in the area so then that will then be be our way of expressing that that um that the, the demand is there what we can do then is is reach out to any private landowners or the local authority to request any land that they they may be willing to enter into the scheme Thank you. I think that brings us to a natural close to this morning's session. I'd like to thank you all for participating, for translating, and to Teresa for organising. I'd like to draw the session to a close and thank you all for your time this morning.